Super Monty Wansler, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And uh, for agreeing to give us a talk here. Um, what is the AAG? What do you do? And who do you represent? Okay, thank you very much for having me. Uh, first of all, the Affirmative Action Group is an empowerment lobby group. Uh, it was established by uh, some of the leading lights in Zimbabwean business, uh, the likes of uh, Strive Masiwa, who's behind Econet, um, uh, Philip Chiangwa, who we all know is behind uh, uh, various property uh, uh, development companies in Zimbabwe, uh, the late Peter Pamire, uh, and uh, the now Minister of Indigenization and Economic Empowerment, Sevia Kasukure, and many other uh, uh, prominent uh, um, Zimbabweans. The whole idea was to uh, uh, promote the involvement of the indigenous people into the mainstream of the economy. Uh, at, at the time when it was initiated, uh, the economy was largely controlled by non-Zimbabweans. If you looked at the stock exchange, it was dominated by non-Zimbabwean uh, uh, shareholders. Yeah. Uh, if you looked at uh, the banking industry, if you looked at the insurance industry, if you looked at agriculture, the whole picture didn't represent uh, an indigenous ownership of the economy. So the thrust of the Affirmative Action Group is to continue to push for that involvement uh, of the indigenous people into the mainstream of the economy. So we represent the indigenous people of Zimbabwe. For as long as you are indigenous, uh, we represent you. Okay. Now, tonight at our Connect to Network in event, we'll be looking at the economic empowerment and indigenization drive in Zimbabwe, and of course, its impact on business, sure. both locally and internationally. Mm -hmm. um, there are various options bubbling about, you know, so could you give us your view on this concept of indigenization and then separately on the se legislation as it is. In terms of indigenization uh, uh, coming from Zimbabwe and coming from an organization that represent uh, uh, the aspirations of the indigenous people to participate in the mainstream of the economy, you know, I believe that indigenization is the way to go. Uh, it is uh, unfortunate that uh, we have had for many years an economy in which non-Zimbabweans play a role, mm. in which the, the main role that is, uh, Zimbabweans play is to provide labor. Uh, I do think that uh, that depicts or, or reflects the situation during the colonial days. But of course, I mean, we have been independent for more than 30 years, but there's nothing to show in terms of control of economic resources by the indigenous people. So I believe that indigenization is a process that will begin to change this. Okay. Of course, there have been concerns by many people in the uh, uh, diaspora and the international community who believe that uh, by pursuing an agenda of indigenization, we are trying to encourage dispossessing uh, the ones that ever had, which are the, uh, the, the non-indigenous, mostly in Zimbabwe, are the white people. Uh, uh, but it doesn't. It doesn't mean that. It actually means that you're saying to the uh, non-indigenous, to the white people, for your investment to be safe, for your investment to be secure, for your future to be guaranteed in Zimbabwe, you have to share. You can't be a, 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 a very rich person surrounded by very poor people because what the poor people are going to do one day is they'll start stealing from you. So you are secure as an investor when you're doing it with the locals. And if you actually look at the policy, uh, going to your question on the, the, the specific law, the policy says minimum shareholding that must go into the hands of the locals is 51%. That means 49% can be owned by uh, non-Zimbabweans. And 49% by any imagination is quite a huge chunk of any shareholding. I know uh, any, some global companies in which even 12% shareholders are the largest uh, uh, shareholders in those companies, and not only the largest, but the richest people in the world. So 49% is quite significant as an investment. Uh, but also at the same time, it does not stop uh, uh, the, uh, the non-indigenous non to control the institutions that they own 49%. For instance, if somebody comes into a brewery and owns 51% uh, as indigenous, most likely that shareholding, that 51% is split among many groups, including employees, including management, including uh, private investors, whereas a 49% shareholder can be an international brewery. So in most instances, there's a lot of pluses in terms of the Indigenization Economic Empowerment Act in Zimbabwe. But more importantly, I think people have focused on ownership uh, instead of focusing on what actually the law entails. The law says ownership is one element of uh, uh, indigenization, but there is also the supply side of empowerment. It is a requirement through the law that 50% of all procurement by companies must be from indigenous companies. In itself, it's a huge empowerment initiative. So there is much more to, uh, to this law than just 51%. Okay. Now, you mentioned Zimbabweans living abroad. Um, <coughs> in the business context, how does this legislation apply to or impact Zimbabweans living abroad? 
um, or Zimbabwean, those of Zimbabwean um, descent who hold at the, at the moment a national, or rather foreign passports or foreign citizenship? Let me, let me start by explaining what the law uh, says in terms of who is indigenous. Uh, the law says that if you were disadvantaged and discriminated against before independence in 1980, you are an indigenous Zimbabwean. Okay. Now, for, for as long as all the groups of you, you have uh, highlighted qualify to be people who were disadvantaged before independence, who were deliberately discriminated against before independence in 1980, they qualify to take advantage of the benefits that are brought about by the Indigenous and Economic Empowerment Act. In terms of the opportunity that is created for the, uh, for the Zimbabweans in the diaspora, now, you've got to understand that Zimbabwe is coming out of 10 years of recession. I mean, we've seen worse than the global recession. Mm -hmm. In fact, global recession is just mild considered to what Zimbabweans have actually gone through. Now, we're coming from a background where we have not had any access to money as Zimbabweans best in Zimbabwe. However, Zimbabweans in the diaspora, because of the exposure and the networks they've been able to build, they have capacity to walk into Lloyd's, to walk into HSBC and raise fund, mm -hmm. funding. They can take that funding into Zimbabwe and buy into companies that want to uh, bring in 51% shareholders or create new ventures that uh, benefit from certain provisions of the Indigenous and Economic Empowerment Act. So I think at the end of the day, it is this Indigenous Economic Empowerment Act is a bigger opportunity for Zimbabweans outside Zimbabwe than Zimbabweans in Zimbabwe. Okay. Because if you talk about business, you always will need capital. And Zimbabweans in Zimbabwe, not many of them have capital. But I think that Zimbabweans in the diaspora have access to capital. Of course. Now, do you agree with the view that the indigenization drive may actually have a negative effect on foreign investors who may want to come into Zimbabwe and do business there? I think that it is the way it is communicated where the danger lies. Okay. The, the law itself, uh, the initiative itself, is actually pro-investment because you are putting your cards on the table. So I know that for many years, investors were sitting on the fence. They did not want to touch Zimbabwe because, number one, they were not sure uh, they, they hear about indigenization, they hear that government may take in 51% or may nationalize, but because it's now in black and white and there's a law, it's now very clear to investors. If you're sitting in London, Hong Kong, Tokyo, or wherever, and you want to go into Zimbabwe, you know what the law says. You know everything is now put on the table. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is, it is very uh, a positive in that it, it clarifies the position. Secondly, I think that it, it is also a, a, a something that... Uh, uh, secures or guarantees an investor. We know that a lot of investors come in and for satisfaction they want to make sure that the locals are happy with their, their engagement and involvement with the country. You, how, there's no other situation that makes any local happy by being a part of shareholding in the same business. So that secures or guarantees any international investor who puts their money into Zimbabwe. But come in and invest 100%, one day they can chase you out. Yeah. But if you're working with locals, those locals will become your saviors because they, they will not allow anything wrong to happen to you because they know your partners in a business. Yes, the way it is communicated sometimes discourages investment, but it, it's because it's not communicated by the people who should communicate it. It's communicated by interest groups, and obviously interest groups take interest positions, and that is the unfortunate situation regarding the Indigenous and Economic Empowerment Act in Zimbabwe. But by and large, it is a positive piece of legislation. It's a positive process that an investor mustn't worry about. Okay. Now, Mr. Mandi Wanzira, you're not just the president of the AAG, but you're also the CEO of Mighty Movies. Sure. Um, could you give us an insight into the media industry in Zimbabwe and if there's anything interesting happening in this space at the moment or um, for the future? Sure. I mean, that the, the media is, is my core business. I mean, obviously, I, I, I started uh, sort of off my career as a journalist and I still do a lot of activities uh, around journalism. I still run a television production company, which is Mighty Movies. I produce TV programs for uh, local uh, television as well as international television. We produce news that have done work for SABC, Al Jazeera, BBC and many other organizations. However, my interest became more on how do I exploit the opportunity in media uh, for my own benefit and the benefit of the people of Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at the various uh, uh, opportunities in the media uh, around uh, newspapers, yeah. around television, around radio. Uh, Zimbabwe does not have private radio or private television. It's still state-owned, uh, which is ZBC. But there are moves to open up that industry, to open up that uh, area for 
private broadcasters. We hope that will happen uh, within the next two to three years. Okay. What I'm very uh, sure will happen this 2011 is the, um, uh, uh, the opening up of space for pay television. Uh, community radio stations. So again, those are areas of opportunities for those that are interested in taking part in those uh, in those uh, uh, in those areas. And also, the advent of uh, broadband uh, in Zimbabwe uh, could create a, a whole huge array of opportunities around what you can do with the capacity uh, of uh, of broadband. Okay. Well, Mr. Mandy Wednesday, thank you very much for your time. Um, we certainly look forward to uh, hearing more of what you have to say in the upcoming event. Thank you very much. Um, Great pleasure. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.